My name's Dave Goulson. I'm Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex. I have a nice big garden. I'm really lucky and I'm basically gardening for wildlife. I'm trying to encourage as many different insects, particularly bees. Bees are my favourites, bumblebees and so on. But also butterflies, birds, the whole, the whole lot. And at the same time, try and produce as much food as I can. I try and kind of feed the family so far as I can with fruit and veg from, from the garden. And the two actually go together really well because we need the bees to pollinate the vegetable crops and the fruit crops and, and so on. There are a number of things that gardeners can do to help with climate change. And they're all, they might all seem like small things, but if everyone did them, that would add up to big stuff. Grow your own fruit and veg. Obviously, most people can't try to be self-sufficient, but even just a few lettuces or, or you know, potatoes or tomatoes or whatever in a grow bag, um, it means that's food you don't have to drive to the supermarket to buy. Farming that produces food conventionally produces lots of greenhouse gases. About a third of all greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, essentially. So if you produce food yourself, it's zero food miles, zero packaging, it's healthy, it's nutritious. Um, much better than, than buying it, so much as you can, you know. It's a sort of overshoot patch with a few bits and bobs in, but uh, um, the, bigger, the bigger patch is just up the hill. Make your own compost, recycle all your kitchen scraps and whatever. Whatever you do, don't buy peat-based composts. I, and the, the, most people are still not even aware of this, but so peat, which makes up about 50% of most compost that you buy from a garden centre. It's a fossil fuel, basically. It's ripped out of the ground. It's, um, it, it's been laid down over tens of thousands of years. It's bits of sort of half-rotted uh, plant material in a peat bog. It's, it's because it's wet, they, it stops rotting, and it just builds up and up and up in this beautiful layer of thick peat. And then you get all sorts of rare plants and animals living on top of it in this specialist habitat. And then we come along, dig the whole lot up, stick it in plastic bags and, and then sprinkle it over our gardens and grow plants in it, which is really dumb. Um, so basically because as soon as it comes out of the bog, apart from ruining the bog, it starts to oxidise and it goes up into the air. So we, we should completely get rid of peat-based composts. Um, so next time you're buying a compost, look for peat-free. There are perfectly good peat-free ones out there. Something else people can do is, is plant a tree. Um, and you know, lots of people don't have a big garden, but actually you can get pretty small trees. And I, I would go for uh, a small fruit tree. So you can get an apple tree on a dwarfing rootstock that's suitable for even a tiny garden. Some of them only get to three or four feet tall. Obviously the bigger the better. You plant a tree, as soon as it starts to grow, it's locking up carbon. It's taking carbon out of the air and turning it into to wood. And when it flowers, if, if it's a fruit tree, um, then it's providing food for insects in the spring and from the blossom. And then it provides food for us later in the year when it fruits. So, you know, it's kind of wins all around. So if everyone was to try and grow a tree or two in their garden and try and grow a few fruits and vegetables and not buy any of that horrible peat-based compost, then it would all start to add up. Growing our own food, you know, we, we buy far less food than probably the average and at this time of year we're more or less completely self-sufficient for fruit and veg and we even actually have our own um, chickens for eggs and turkeys for meat um, uh, and so so basically you know that massively reduces the all, the, all the, the carbon footprint that otherwise would be created by buying in all that food that's produced normally by kind of industrial scale agriculture. Obviously everyone thinks it's going to get hotter and it, on average it is going to get warmer here but we're also, the, the, probably the most dramatic change is we're going to have more extreme weather events and it, both strangely probably droughts and floods and it seems like a bit daft that we might have both but obviously we won't get them at the same time but that's what the predictions suggest. So it's going to be harder to grow crops because some years they'll, they'll die because there won't be enough water or they won't won't produce as much yield as they normally do. In other years, um, they'll be flooded out. Um, uh, we're going to have difficulty supplying fresh water to everybody um, into the future, I mean, it, particularly in the southeast where we've got a huge number of people and we need to be really careful how we use water because we're already extracting too much from rivers and so on. Um, and things like watering our lawn, I think in the future we're going to have to stop doing. So another small tip is you don't cut your lawn too short because it's much more tolerant to drought if it's longer. If it's really short it dies if, it, if, a, if a drought comes along but if it's longer 
then it's much more resistant.